Welcome. I'm Lori Lee Binstock, and this is a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast. Happy New Year and welcome back, folks. Thank you for joining us for a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast on Mental Health News Radio Network. This podcast is also available wherever you get your podcasts, but I do suggest checking out Mental Health News Radio Network to find all your podcasts related to mental health. Today's guest is Jacqueline Aludo, anti-trafficking specialist, victim's advocate, filmmaker. Among many titles, she is also the president of No Trafficking Zone. No Trafficking Zone is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the prevention and elimination of human trafficking. Their mission is to disrupt and dismantle human trafficking by creating no trafficking zones that implement high-risk penalties and crimes for predators that prey on children and adults. Jacqueline's gift for intersecting media, intelligence, technology, law enforcement, and community-based organizations makes her valuable across many spectrums. Jacqueline deploys these skills to prevent and combat commercial sexual exploitation and combat commercial sexual exploitation, oppression, abuse, human trafficking, and sex crimes. Woo! Jacqueline, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate being on the on your show. Well, so so much that you're doing in this space. And, you know, I, I really want to know, how did you get into this work? I got into human trafficking uh, a little over 20 years ago. I had decided that I wanted to make a film, a documentary, and it was called Not In My Backyard. And I had spent seven years filming across America in underground battered women and children shelters where women and children were seeking refuge against uh, domestic violence. And on my journey, what was happening was is in all these different shelters, we were seeing a trend where there was also homeless children. But at the time, they were calling some of these homeless teens child prostitutes. And we know that children cannot be prostitutes. They are victims, even if children think that they are willing participants in sexual abuse, trafficking, crimes, and exploitation. Um, they are victims. And so I went to my mentor, because <clears throat> this was a little over 20 years ago, and I said, Sandra, have you ever heard of really children being bought and sold for sex at such an alarming rate? Um, all these different domestic violence shelters and foster care facilities were seeing this. And she said, oh yeah, that's human trafficking. And once I had learned about human trafficking, there wasn't a lot on the internet back then. Um, I just couldn't leave it. And it just became something that I kind of found my purpose from God. I definitely found my purpose from God and realized that creating films really to educate people Uh, specifically on these specific crimes was important to let people in our nation know and what what was breaking the cycle of violence and abuse and exploitation, but also what was perpetuating it. Because on our journey through the seven years, we did find institutions and organizations that were actually perpetuating violence, oppression, and abuse. And so that was the beginning of, you know, um, really diving into what is human trafficking in the United States of America? Wow. Well, what did perpetuate? What did you learn that perpetuated this whole cycle? We learned a lot. Um, You know, human trafficking is a $245 billion business. Uh, We all used to say it was $150 billion. The new stat is $245 billion. And I believe that that is because I just saw this where they broke it down into this, uh, Second, so that's over seventy five hundred dollars every second, um, which is a lot of money. And so, like any other business with that much money, because that's going to bring in more money than oil and Nike combined. Um, but like any other business, it has different markets. And so, what facilitates those markets? We know that profit and participation. Human trafficking has always been, which it's slavery of our time. It's the sex slave trade of our time. Um, And what that really looks like and and, and is, and I don't like to say modern day slavery because I don't like to put such a nice word modern in front of it, is that 
besides a lot of people profiting and participating in it, it was always a low risk crime. Meaning if I did this crime and I bought and sold people, it, it wasn't enough harsh penalties, but it was so lucrative. So traffickers and pedophiles and pimps really got into this business. You saw a lot of drug dealers jump over to also pimping and trafficking because you were getting more crimes for selling, for selling drugs than you were for selling people. Wow. And so we wanted to make it a high risk crime where we would deter pedophiles and criminals and traffickers and pimps and sexual deviants from getting involved in this crime because the the reward of making money um, would not outweigh the risks. And so we really wanted to create no trafficking zones where no trafficking zones through in the United States of America was when you saw these no, no trafficking zones specifically where children were being targeted, it would be at least 25 to 99 years per life instead of a slap on the wrist or probation, which is what we were seeing across across our nation. Yeah, I feel like they don't put into account the trauma that the victims experience because that is lifelong, right? And yeah, do so these trafficking zones are they throughout the U.S. and are they everywhere? Should it be something that's federally um, handled? Yeah. Well, the, so the dream is that all of the United States becomes a no trafficking zone. That that's the perfect dream, you know. Um, but what happened was is um, our our first organization that we started it was Break the Cycle USA and Real Beauty Real Women, and that really focused on victim services and advocacy. Uh, no trafficking zone really got into the legislative pieces of it and creating these zones. We we saw these these holes on when we were working with children and families, whether we had recovered them or worked with law enforcement, or were working with families for advocacy. And we saw one trend where either a large amount of kids were coming from the foster care system. There's a big foster care pipeline to sex trafficking and commercial sexual exploitation. And we saw that on the school grounds. And so with schools, it's either it's connected to school campuses, bus stops, uh, fellow kids recruiting fellow kids, a kid introducing you to another person at a party, there was these major intersections. And we started realizing, okay, like in the state of Texas, when the kids were being trafficked, being picked up on their school campuses, parents weren't even noticing or administration of the kids were in foster care because it was after you get, after the attendance sheet was being called in Texas, the schools get their money. So they don't take attendance any more classes or they don't report it. And so criminals knew that and they were um, trafficking kids during those times. But trafficking on school campuses and commercial sexual exploitation is rampant through the United States of America. We passed that bill in Texas, SB 1831, no trafficking zones in schools in Texas, where it's a first degree felony punishable for 25 to 99 years to life, but it also includes like any electronic devices. So we know that there's social media mixed in that, gaming, um, platforms, a pimp and trafficker could send an Uber, a Lyft to pick you up at school, uh, messages. And so all of that while you're in school or at a school function also breaks that zone because we wanted to eliminate the electronic social media platform to it, which is a big intersection with our youth and commercial sexual exploitation. Then we expanded the no trafficking zones this year to foster care facilities, uh, I believe community centers, residential treatment centers, and then all uh, college campuses and, and higher education campuses. Because we also knew that um, on college campuses, there's a, a high rate for commercial sexual exploitation and trafficking. And COVID really showed us that here because the kids that were aging out of the foster care system in college or were very poor and had nowhere to go and lived on college campus. When the college campuses shut down, they weren't getting their meals from college anymore. Um, and so they were either, um, they are being trafficked and preyed upon at a much higher rate. So we expanded um, 
the zones here and we have a federal bill in Congress right now, we're just um, waiting for it to get heard on, on the House floor. And that would encompass the schools, uh, foster care facilities all together, making it a federal crime. And the reason why we like uh, federal crimes is because a lot of times when you go to court and you get charged with a crime, you can plead down, get out on good behavior. When you get charged with a federal crime, if they say you're going to do 15 years, like you're doing 15 years. And so we really want this to be a federal crime across our, uh, the nation so that pimps and traffickers understand like there will be no playing down and um, there will be no getting out on good behavior. Like you will do all of your, your time. And then it's a deterrent in these zones to either tr either try to prey or traffic our most vulnerable. Right. And then they really do target the most vulnerable, anyone who's dealing with any issues or any, you know, mental health issues or anything like that. That's that, that's who they basically target. Correct. Yeah. Marginalized communities, mm -hmm. um, you know. The war on poverty is very lucrative and, and that's something that really has to be addressed and that could be uh from trailer parks, Jeffrey Epstein proved that, you know, we, we rarely hear people talking about trailer parks, but uh, Epstein wanted uh, specific kids. So he would have, he would recruit and traffic girls out of trailer parks, and then he would send them in and give them two to $300 for every kid that they recruited from those trailer parks, because those kids were so poor. Um, in other instances, foster care facilities with other trafficking rings, uh, communities of color, that's a really big ring. A any kind of mar marginalized communities uh, are really targeted. However, human trafficking is so lucrative that even though there there is a target on our most vulnerable, anyone and any kid can be trafficked in, in our nation. Because if you can make three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars per victim per year, um, and the lifespan will be seven years, you're gonna you're going to do that if you're an organized crime or you're a pimp or a trafficker. Would would a pimp or a trafficker, would they recruit somebody in a way that they would gain their trust, like basically groom them? Or or it, is it possible that they just pluck them out of, you know, like kidnap them out of, you know, a, a playground? So I think kidnapping um, is very rare. Mm -hmm. You know, abductions are very rare when it comes to trafficking. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but, you know, the movie taken is just very unrealistic for your, your traditional way of, of trafficking someone. Uh, grooming and recruiting is really the way to go because traditionally, um, before law enforcement was getting so evolved in this crime and, and our nation, if someone willingly went with you, even if you were trafficking them or sexually exploiting them, it it was hard to to do a missing a missing report. Um, it was really hard to commit a crime. You'd go to law enforcement 10 years ago and they'd say, well, you know, they went willingly, um, they weren't kidnapped. And so grooming is, is a mental abdu uh, abduction, you know, grooming and recruiting is developing a trauma bond. And that trauma bond is, I'm gonna listen to you. I'm gonna become your favorite person, whether I'm another girl and you don't have any friends and you're being bullied, I'm going to become your best, best friend or whether I'm, I'm a boy and I'm going to be a Romeo pimp and I'm going to make you um, feel beautiful and, and liked. My job as a predator is to pray and that is to learn all of your vulnerabilities so I can exploit them all and learn all of your family's vulnerabilities so I can exploit them all. And as I'm exploiting you and grooming you, I'm turning you inside out. I'm testing your boundaries to see how far can I go each time I gain more and more trust until I'm changing this person's identity to be completely what I need and want. And not just to be completely what I need and want until their identity is me. Mm. They think that they can't live without me. And so that's really how grooming and recruiting works. And then there's layers of taking kids to parties, giving them drugs, then taping them if they're doing any sexual acts, sextortion, you know, kids, text now, um, 
very sexually. We've normalized, we live in a sexual culture. We've normalized sex and kids watching it at such a young age that parents are like, oh, my kid would never send that. Do you see what's on TV? Do you see what's on social media? Do you see what's in our schools? Mm -hmm. And then when they send pictures or videos, a lot of times it'll spread around schools, which will also drive victims to their traffickers and predators even more. And, and I say that because if if I'm being if I'm being sexually exploited and I'm a young girl and I've been raped and trafficked and now I'm on drugs, self-medicating and trying not to remember what's happened to me. And that's how my predator controls me. And my parents are saying, who are you? I don't recognize you anymore. The flight, fright, flight, fight, freeze or fawn can, can happen. And it does happen. And a lot of times the reason why kids also leave is because they don't, they miss the person that they used to be, but they know that they can never go back to that. Um, trauma bonding is very real. People also don't even talk about the trauma bond, how your hormones and endorphins are so different. So when you're trying to break a trauma bond, it's also like you are breaking an addiction to a drug mm, wow. on top of everything else happening. So it's just a really intricate crime. It's not like a bank. You don't go in the one way and rob the bank and go out. There's so many different ways to traffic and exploit someone and recruit and groom them. And hopefully we can educate everyone on it as it always is evolving um, so that we can best protect um, our nation and our children. Yeah, you know, there, there are so many myths. And I think that was one of the the ones that I, I, I realized was that these traffickers aren't just going in and plucking people from from playgrounds. And then, that, you know, that's like you said, it, it 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 can happen, but that is not the traditional way that it does happen. Um, and I'm I'm you know I can imagine there are so many myths that um you know people believe. Um, but are there any ones that in particular that you think feel that needs to be busted that we you know myths that you want to make clear are not true? I mean, I think too, like trafficking a lot of times is really hidden in plain sight. You know, you see it. You see girls walking and a lot of times people think that they're that they're sex workers um that they're not being controlled and but but you don't see the the trafficker or or the bottom the person that works right with the the, the, the trafficker um to control the other girls um or you don't see the mental abduction where they're afraid or you don't see that they have a quota that they have to bring back to their pimp and trafficker and if they don't bring that money back they're going to get beat um, this this con misconception of well, why don't they just leave? Uh, I think what people also have to realize about trauma bonding is it's it's a bit like you know domestic violence also where you love the person abusing you because it's not like they just start off from the jump abusing you. They're the same people that push you off the cliff but catch you too. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to leave that and even understand it. That's why many times victims don't identify with being victims. They just can't wrap their head around it and everything happening. They feel so ashamed and so dirty that they think that it's their fault. And the more dirty and ashamed that they feel, the more they're gonna stay with their traffickers and their predators because they think these are the only people that love me really for what I am. Um, when they're being controlled to be that way. And so I think that People don't understand it is really hidden a lot of times in plain sight. Uh, you're not going to see girls shackled on the sides of the street because um, that would be alarming. And then you would run up to 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 help those girls. Right. It's it they, they look like they are free will walking around. Um, I, I think the other misconception and, you know, this is a very unpopular one that people get upset with me sometimes, but people always say, if you see something, say something. And I'm not always a fan of that because I tell uh, the girls that we work with um, who outcry or are afraid to outcry, a lot of times law enforcement can protect them from their pimps or traffickers or organized crime 
or a lot of times people don't give them the re realistic reality that a case can take four to five years. Jeffrey Epstein trafficked girls for 30 years. And so if you have a powerful predator, which we're seeing everywhere, um, if you have a powerful predator, they can traffic people for so long because it, it's, it's organized crime. Um, also, you know, traffickers, pedophiles, pimps, they can look like anyone. They could be judges. They could be lawyers. They could be pastors. They could be bishops. They could be policemen. They can be CEOs. They could be very wealthy. They could be thugs on the street. They can really be um, anyone. They could be gay. They could be straight, trans, black, white, you know. Um, and, and I go through this whole mix because a lot of times no trafficking zone will post stuff and um, people will go, oh, but did you know uh, this, this, this group's trafficking? And so I like to say to everybody, we do not discriminate. We are equal opportunists. If you are a predator, like we're coming for you. Mm -hmm. We don't care if you're white or black or, or, or Muslim or Jewish or Christian. Um, if you're a priest or a pope or a pastor or a bishop or a policeman or a teacher or wealthy or poor, our goal is to make sure that every predator that there is um, we want them behind bars so that they can never, never hurt a child or anyone else. And I think that people get these misconceptions thinking that predators are just one type of group or one type of people. And that's not the case. Wow. Yeah. That is, that is terrifying, right? It could be anyone you can trust, especially people that hold authority like law enforcement or a pastor you know, most yes. of the most vulnerable people come to them. And that That's is exactly terrifying. It. The most the most vulnerable and broken people. What people don't realize is that predators go into those specific roles for those reasons, because they're going to be around um, the most broken and vulnerable people as they have such positions of power, not only in the setting, but in the community and, and, and in wealthy structures. And so they would be a lot uh, more people to be protected because there's a lot of interest b by them. And so, you know, getting convictions for powerful predators sometimes can be very hard, but also very dangerous. Um, and so we really like to make sure that we walk alongside the victims through that whole process um, and let law enforcement understand like criminology and victimology. But what does this family need or this victim need to heal? Uh, healing is such an important aspect of it and should be the most important one. And I, I, I know I talked to you about this. You posted something on your Instagram regarding Roblox and that really um, like really perked my ears up because I know several parents who let their children play games, you know, on the internet and, and Roblox is just one that I've heard. Um, and so um, could you elaborate on that avenue that traffickers are going to recruit um, young children? Sure. So commercial sexual exploitation, CSAM, child sexual abuse material, child sexual abuse images, um, all that stuff, a lot of that, you know, you that is, uh, it's a lot of times targeted over the internet and these games. Gaming platforms are huge for traffickers and pedophiles with sextortion. So roadblock specific games normally not always will target um, the demographic of kids that that play those games. Um, and so that's where a lot of times you'll see with boys and girls sextortion where you're in these group chats with these kids and they're befriending you. And then it's like, hey, well, I like you. And then a lot of times the kid is like, oh, take off your shirt. And again, this is gradual. Um, these kids really think because that's how they communicate with their friends is through a screen. And so they think that they're communicating with another kid. And a, a lot of times that's how they're being targeted for commercial sexual exploitation, uh, sex trafficking, and um, sextortion. And it's really important to educate parents on what to look for, what kind of wording, you know, a, a text like, oh, you sound a lot more mature than 10 years old you know, another 10 year old is not going to say that. Um, mm -hmm. Or it would be alarming as to say that and, and why. 
also teaching kids because it's so normalized for them to be in these group chats and all these games that when we tell them stuff, they think that we're worrying because it's so normal for them. But then to show them and parents what they should be looking for. Um, another thing that I forgot to touch on outside of uh, gaming is, or these social media platforms is people are not normally scared of females. And with Maxwell, she was Epstein's recruiter. And she was that because if I'm a female or I'm a little girl or a little boy, I'm going to trust a nice woman a lot more than I'm going to trust a man to go mm -hmm. with. And so I wanted to talk about the misconceptions that parents, kids, um, caregivers really need to understand that women will pray and recruit and be madams and traffickers just like men. No. Yeah, that, that I, 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 you know, that just as well as, you know, pastors, that is, you know, it's very, very deceiving and, and very yeah. easy to fall into that. Yeah, it's scary. Um, it's very scary. And, and that's also another reason why it's really important to also, you know, make sure that your churches have reporting systems. If it is a pastor or a deacon or where do you report who holds who holds them accountable um, also to besides law enforcement. But if something happens, um, the churches should really have these reporting systems. Schools should have re reporting systems. The problem is what we really see too much, sadly, whether it's on the internet for holding big tech accountable or these games or social media platforms or schools um, or churches is that everyone is more uh, worried about liability versus accountability. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is accountability breeds responsibility. And if I know that there's our laws and systems set up in place for pastors or religious um, entities or schools that get away with um, sex crimes where they have to be reported different, well, then I know I'm not really going to be held responsible. And so that's, as a predator, that would be one of the first places that I would go because um, I would know that I would be able to prey on the most vulnerable people and it would be harder to hold me accountable. So it, it's up to us to implement those systems and make sure that our governments and our community leaders make sure that they're, they are imp implemented. Is there, um, is there a way, I know you mentioned it's, you know, human trafficking can be ha happening in plain sight. How do, what what should we do if we recognize that something doesn't seem right? So it's, that depends on where you are. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you're a sporting event, no trafficking zone. We did the first uh, no trafficking zone sports stadium at NRG Park. It's the most vid visited stadium in um, our nation. We know that we couldn't put, implement laws into sports stadiums yet. So we implemented systems and then a reporting system. So wherever you go, um, I would try to check and see, okay, is there a reporting system? You know, if there's a school, you know, different, different states have different laws. Right. What would be the reporting reporting system? I would ask if you belong to a church, if your kid goes to, to a school, when there is a sex crime, who do you report it to? in your community or town or wherever you're at, is there a human trafficking unit? Is there a human trafficking division or is there a sex crimes division? I would ask all of those different things. And then that would help with who you report it to. And I would always say in your area, always find out your victim service and advocacy group. Wow. Yes. Cause they're going to advocate for you in a much different way. Do you have the different advocacy groups through your website or is what resources can people go to um, to find that out? So, I mean, each each state, city, county, they all have different um, advocacy groups. Like in Harris County, um, there's there's a list of advocacy agencies. Um, and then but but again, each state has different groups. And so you would just Google you know, let's say you live in Washington, 
you know, uh, human trafficking advocates in Washington, D.C. And then it'll it'll come up um, and it should show you all that. I think that would be the quickest way. If people want to go in no trafficking zone, our website is www.notraffickingzone.org. You can find out all the different services that we're providing, different laws that like we're really legislating for, the ones that we have passed, the services that we offer. Um, we have college campuses that we are expanding throughout the nation on our unmuted podcast where students against slavery have really done this amazing job at how students feel about trafficking because they're saying it in their words. You know, I'm not, I'm not a, I don't go to high school anymore. So I can't really tell you what it's like to be a high school student, but I want high school students to tell me and, and tell us what happens when they do re report it. And that's just so important because we really see this problem of when people are abused in these specific institutions that the things that we think would happen, whether it's a teacher sexually abusing or trafficking um, a student or whether it's it's an outsider, they're not being punished the way they should be at at, at the rate that we believe. Because again, it's that um, these institutions are more worried about liability versus accountability. Yeah. So students in slavery is really breaking breaking down on all the different campuses, what they're doing to make a difference. And so we're just so proud to be one of the co-founders and creators of that. Oh, that is so amazing. Um, and the work that you're doing, incredible. And, you know, I do hope federally this is this, this, the everywhere becomes no trafficking zone. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add? Or is there anything that you think is important for this audience to know and understand? Um, I think it's really important that we start teaching children at a young age uh, self-worth and boundaries. Um, growing up as a kid, you know, I grew up in a different era where if Uncle Johnny or like Aunt so-and-so, Susie, wanted to hug you, you had to hug them, you had to be polite, even if you didn't feel comfortable. Yeah. And that's been ingrained in our heads uh, to be polite even at our detriment. And I think it's really important to stop normalizing that behavior. Our bodies and instincts tell us things for a reason. And if we don't feel comfortable hugging someone, we shouldn't hug them. And uh, we have to really teach kids about boundaries because we live in a world where boundaries are being very blurred, mm -hmm. which means anything can go. And when you live in a world where boundaries can be blurred, it's really hard to have an identity and who you are. And that plays a big part of self-worth and self-esteem. And so I think it's really important if we are going to combat sex crimes at the rate that they're happening. So many times it's because kids really didn't understand when their boundaries were pushed that they could say no and still be a good person, that, that their feelings um, matter, that sometimes you have to be impolite because predators they are going to be aggressive or manipulative and you're going to have to be impolite and that's okay. doesn't mean, it doesn't actually mean that you're impolite. It means that you are saying, I don't feel comfortable doing this. And I think that's a big point about self-worth. Also, when we start blurring lines on boundaries, we see it with this new generation. Exploitation is so easy. There's, there's this mixture of that, exploitation has become women's empowerment. Um, you know, selling ourselves on the internet and um, being exploited. You know, a lot of young people think, well, that's empowering. Um, we're em empowering ourselves. Like we're, we're beating the patriarch, but that's just what misogynists want. You know, I'm going to throw money at, at you and, and sell, sell yourself. So I, I want to also just say that, this indoctrination of exploitation and grooming our children to not have boundaries and to sexualize everything, we really need to stop normalizing it because that's how our kids are getting into it so quickly. The average child in America watches pornography at eight years old. And so they're already seeing in their head because pornography is, is so violent now 
the girl thinks this is how I should be treated. The boy thinks this is how I should treat someone. Right. On top of that, they shouldn't be watching having sex. So we have to really, we have to really start treating kids like kids again and understand that like they, they are kids and stop normalizing, uh, putting such adult behavior on them because it really is abusive. Yeah. Wow. No, I absolutely agree with the boundaries. And you're right. I also grew up in that era where you had to hug any adult who wants a hug, regardless. Otherwise, you're just being disrespectful, which is absolutely was the wrong thing. And I'm I'm fortunate through all of my healing and all of my learning and, and speaking to people like you, you know, I my my children don't hug anyone. They don't want to hug. <laughs> so they they, you know, I agree. Self worth and and you know self compassion, self acceptance is really the way they can avoid that whole fe- feeling vulnerable and you know really m- get making themselves wide open to something like this. Yeah, I I agree a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Um, thank you so much for having us on the show. If anyone wants to follow us, you know. Everything's really no trafficking zone, LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok, uh, Facebook. And, you know, please continue to just pray that we make America uh, a no trafficking zone. Wow. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Your wisdom is amazing. Okay. That was Jacqueline Aludo, anti trafficking specialist, victims advocate and president of No Trafficking Zone. She is joining us today. And if you want to find more information on her, you can check out the show notes. You can find out information on No Trafficking Zone and her information as well. January's issue of Authentic Insider is out. um, And we do have a piece from our prosecutor's point of view on human trafficking. Just check out Authentic Insider at TraumaSurvivorThriver.com. That's TraumaSurvivorThriver.com, as well as past episodes of a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my email list to get Authentic Insider magazine in your inbox monthly. We will be back next week when I speak with Cindy Benezra about surviving sexual trauma by a family member. You've been listening to a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast. I'm Lori Lee Binstock. Thank you so much for being a part of the conversation. Take care.